Hi, I'm Scott Hahn, and I want to welcome you to The Road to Emmaus, a podcast from the St. Paul Center. Uh, Today, we're going to be doing a special episode of our podcast to respond to a number of questions and objections that have been raised regarding a... um, an interview that I had with my dear friend, Matt Frad back on October 19th, Thursday morning. And then also some flack that I got from a talk that I gave a week later on Thursday evening, October 26th. Both of these, the interview and the presentation on Thursday, October 26th, were drawing from my book with Brandon McGinley, Catholics in Exile, Biblical Wisdom for Our Journey Home. And it generated a fair amount of, um, of pushback. And some of it, I suppose, was um, hostile, adversarial. Uh, some of it was more friendly fire. But I just want to stop and just clarify my purpose for our special episode today is to respond in terms of what I receive as a fraternal correction. And I'll clarify that more as we move on, but I want to welcome my dear friend and partner here, our Vice President at the St. Paul Center, Rob Corzine. Welcome back to the special episode. Pleasure as always. So let me explain what I am responding to, and then perhaps later on we can actually incorporate that clip so that people who have not seen it or heard it might know what I am talking about. But uh, I want to just say this, that When I get from people, whether it's direct and private, like you read in Matthew 18, or if it's indirect and public and might seem to be somewhat adversarial in tone, I think the only safe way for someone who wants to be a saint to respond is to accept this as from the Lord, as a correction. And it might be delivered in a nice soft envelope, or it might be delivered in in something that isn't so soft. But the importance of fraternal correction to me is undervalued. The value of fraternal correction is not only growth in humility and teachability, but also it affords me the opportunity as a teacher to uh, offer clarity and greater precision. And also, in this case, I really believe to offer a correction to something that I said. So when I receive this fraternal correction, and a number of my close friends and coworkers have shared with me what they've been seeing online, uh, I took it to prayer. I wrote it up in my own prayer journal, took it to my spiritual director as well. But I really believe, like what Joseph would say to his brothers near the end of Genesis, whatever you meant it for, God meant it for my good. I'm also inspired by the example of one of my absolute favorite theologians, namely St. Augustine, who in 426 AD, around the age of 72, published something unique, and that is, it's often mistranslated as the retractions. In the Latin, retractations uh, might be a better translation. And it's not simple, it's not simply retracting what he had said in his earlier works, but he's going back over all of these earlier works of his, and these are reconsiderations. These are revisions. And I suppose in some instances, perhaps they even rise to the level of a correction. And I would say in this case, I want to respond by acknowledging the fact that when I gave that interview to Matt, we had a blast, you know. Uh, and when you're doing an interview, you, you kind of forget, you know, what it, what, what, what it is that you would give in a classroom lecture or what it is that you would publish in a book. You know, I can really relate to Pope Francis, I suppose, on this point, because when he's giving an interview, he'll often toss the script and do what he often describes as make a mess. And perhaps uh, I made a mess. So I want to pinpoint what it is that I said and then adjust what I said and indicate what I should have said. Maybe sweep up a little bit. That's right. Yeah, the mess. So the, the, the precise line that I would retract is this careless, if not reckless line, that it is heretical to say that the Pope is the head of the church. What I was talking about at the time was the Catholic Church as universal, encompassing what the Catechism says, all three states, the church in glory, the church triumphant, 
the Pilgrim Church, that is the Church Militant, and the Suffering Church. Now, the Pope is clearly the head of the Church that is visible, that is the Church throughout the world, that he is the head of all of the churches if we understand the different rites that compose the Catholic Church. And so it was wrong of me to say that it is heretical to say that the Pope is the head of the Church because the Pope is the head of the Church. And in the first millennium, there were some councils that said that. In the second millennium, you have a number of popes. Uh, I have a lot of these sources in front of me now, and I I really want to stand by the fact that it would be wrong to say that the Pope is not the head of the Church in any sense. No, the Pope is the head of the Church in a very particular sense. And what we see in the Catechism, what we hear in Vatican II, what we hear especially in Pastor Eternus in Vatican I back in 1870, is that the Pope is the head of the visible church throughout all of the world, throughout all of the nations. And I just want to basically say it was wrong of me to say that it's heretical. Uh, You know, one of my favorite movies is A Man for All Seasons, you know, and uh, when Thomas More is uh, engaging with his son-in-law, Will Roper, you know, about Luther being a heretic. And... uh, (laughs) Now, that's a word I don't like. That's right. Well, it's not a likable word. It's not a likable thing. <laughs> and so I usually avoid the H word like the plague, but uh, at least to twice in the span of seven days in the interview with Matt, as well as in the presentation uh, in the gallery, then on Thursday, October 26th, I said it. And uh, I hereby retract it. And I also want to just thank God for the occasion of grace that comes when you realize that in order to make a point, you kind of state it carelessly, you, you, you state it sloppily, you state it in a way that is misleading, at least if not inaccurate. And I would say it was inaccurate to the point of erroneous. In fact, if you took that statement out of its context, you'd have to say, it's heretical. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I want to put it back into context, but before I do, what I really want to do is once again, Just give public testimony to the gratitude to the people, not only the ones who brought it to my attention who were, you know, sort of supporters, but to the ones who brought it to everybody's attention because they were really on to something. And so whatever their motives, thank God for their desire for faithfulness. And uh, I just, I want to thank them too because... However they meant it, it really, it, it, and, and the fact is, I'm not here to appease them. <laughs> I'm not here, in effect, to, um, to placate them. They, they might not be placated by what I'm going to say, you know, but I am here to please Jesus. I want to— If you I, cause confusion, you have an obligation to clear it up, and you clearly confused people who had an orthodox understanding, and so I think— you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. It behooves thing. me, yes, yeah. yeah. It's not just me doing a favor to them. It's me doing a favor to me and to the Lord and his people. And a justice. That's right. You know, I don't know exactly where to begin, but I suspect that a good starting point might be this phrase that comes from a book by one of my favorite philosophers, Jacques Maritain. In the 20th century, he wrote a book called The Three Degrees of Knowledge, but it, it's actually entitled, on the, when you look at the title page, it's Distinguish to Unite. And no wonder, because that's what his master does. St. Thomas Aquinas does what any good theologian does, perhaps better than any other theologian, and that is to make distinctions, you know, that we have distinction in unity. And it's a very important principle, perhaps the most important principle in theology, in our tradition, and that is to distinguish, not to separate, not to oppose or divide, but to distinguish, to unite, and to show how these things are related. Now, there are obvious examples of where we need to distinguish, to unite. In the early church, we distinguish one God from three persons, all right? We don't distinguish one God from three persons to separate them. We distinguish to unite the triunity. And perhaps even more obviously, it's the case in Christology. We distinguish the human nature from Jesus, from his divine nature, in order to show how his person, his hypostasis, 
forms what we would describe as the hypostatic union of these two natures. They're not mixed, they're not confused, but they're not separated or divided. And if you distinguish to divide, there's a, there's a name for that. It's Nestorianism. That's right. And later on, it's I say this with a certain amount of reverent affection for my own roots, Protestantism, sola scriptura. Well, even if Scripture has a certain unique role that, you know, is different than tradition or, you know, faith alone. Uh, and so the idea that you want to emphasize something so much that you end up negating other truths that are indivisibly united, inseparably connected. And I think that's exactly what I did. And I, I don't ever go back and listen to myself. I suppose if I end up in purgatory, that might be a painful part of the process <laughs> of being purged. But I did go back and listen to this, and I realized that you need to distinguish to unite. And in this case, I would say what it is that we need to distinguish is what the Catechism teaches, what Vatican II teaches, what the early church teaches, what you find in Ephesians and Colossians and elsewhere. And that is when we profess our belief in the Holy Spirit and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, uh, we're talking about something that transcends the earthly Catholic church, the visible church, where the Pope is indeed the head of the visible church. You might even describe him as the visible head, uh, but in no way does he usurp Christ's headship. And so when you hear in Ephesians 1, uh, Paul says in Ephesians 1, he has put all things under his feet and has made him, Christ, the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He's talking about something that transcends the earth, and that includes the heaven, where Christ is enthroned as the king of kings, where he is the head of the mystical body. And yet, as the king of kings in heaven, he left behind on earth a visible head, and that was the vicar of Christ, the pope. Peter, and all of the successors of Peter down to the present day with Pope Francis. And as the vicar of Christ, as the successor to Peter, he is the head of the church. He doesn't oppose Christ's headship. He expresses it. That's right. And so when we distinguish Christ's headship over the church, that includes all three states. So in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 954, we read the three states of the church. When the Lord comes in glory and all his angels with him, death will be no more and all things will be subject to him. But at the present time, some of his disciples are pilgrims on earth. Others have died and are being purified, while still others are in glory contemplating in full light God himself triune and one exactly as he is. And so it, it basically is distinguishing one holy Catholic and apostolic church in terms of the church triumphant, the church militant, and the church suffering, but there aren't three churches. And so when we identify Christ as the absolute head of the church in all three states, that doesn't in any way take away the need to say that the Pope is the head of the church. The Pope is the head of the church of all nations. The Pope is the visible head of the church on earth. And that bond is so inseparably tight that as Jesus says to Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven so that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven or will have been bound. It's a kind of perfect active participle there. And so you don't have the earthly tail wagging the heavenly dog, as I think I might have said in my, my conversation with Matt Fratt. But once you recognize that the Pope's headship is derived from Christ's headship, that it's dependent upon Christ's headship, that in fact it participates in Christ's own absolute headship. That doesn't diminish, devalue, or in any way decrease what the church has affirmed about the Pope as the head of the church. In fact, if anything, it establishes it. It clarifies the mystery of the Pope's headship as being something that is legal, juridical, institutional, but more. It really is sacramental, and it partakes of this mystery of sacramentality that unites heaven and earth, just as Christ unites divinity and humanity. And so 
if you distinguish to unite, you end up discovering that that principle applies to so many things that you really end up with that unity of truth, but a unity in diversity where, you know, for most for most of our experience, if you have that much diversity, it threatens to subvert the unity. But in the case of the mystery of the mystical body of Christ, that much diversity actually enhances the unity of the Catholic Church. Just as we see the diversity of races, ethnicities, and how saints are drawn from all of these peoples and places and enhance the unity of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I would say that when we have popes down through the ages sharing in Christ's own absolute headship, their own relative share, that participation, that dependency, uh, that der- derivation is actually far greater than any CEO could ever claim as he is the head of some corporation. Indeed. So, you know, it, it is not heresy to say that the, the Pope is the head of the church. It would be heresy to rule that out or to exclude it altogether. Um, but at the same time, we wouldn't want to say he's the absolute head or he's the only head even when we identify his headship over the whole entire earthly church, uh, we'd want to clarify it in the light of Ephesians 1.22. As I said, I'm also reminded of what Paul tells the Colossians in chapter 1, verse 18, after establishing the primacy of Christ in chapter 1, verse 15, where he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So the primacy of Christ and his absolute preeminence in all of creation and in all of salvation history actually serves as a much better basis for the headship of the Pope over the whole church on earth than simply the number of votes that he got from the College of Cardinals. Yeah, he functions as the head of the body on on earth, but is a part of the body in respect to Christ. That's right. And as you see Christendom crumbling, as you see the Catholic civilization that we study in history, as we see it disintegrating, as we see it being attacked, you can recognize why it is that after the French Revolution, you know, uh, you you have the need by 1870 for the document of Vatican I entitled Pastor Eternus. And I'm not going to bother reading extensively from this, but chapter 2, part 4, as well as chapter 3.1, are both clearly establishing not only that he is the vicar of Christ, that he has primacy as the successor to Peter, but that his primacy implies a headship over all of the church. And this is something that Christ, by the power of the Spirit, safeguards so dramatically, so supernaturally, that we can actually define here in this amazing document what? The infallibility of the Pope. And so you can sense that's, you know, how we're distinguishing, okay, he's the vicar of Christ as the prime minister, okay, he has primacy as well, and the primacy is not just juridical, it's also doctrinal, it's sacramental, and so you you can acknowledge the fact that we've had Pope Alexander VI, we had Pope Benedict IX, we've had Pope John XXII, we've had a, a fair number of bad popes, I mean, uh, actually far fewer bad popes than you had bad Davidic kings in the monarchy that God established a covenant with through David and Solomon. Or even if you include Judas, we had a better ratio than our Lord did in picking apostles. Yes, indeed. Okay. So (laughs) so there we have it. But it's not just Pastor Eternus. It's also the case that um, this Vatican I document is citing the Council of Florence in the 15th century, the decree on the Armenians as well. Because when the Armenians were sort of becoming autocephalous but wanting reunion, you know, back in that period, there was the need to recognize not just the unique authority of the Pope, but his primacy and 
headship. And the same thing was true with the East at Florence in the 15th century. And, and there, there's so much documentation for it. There's no excuse for me to say it's heretical to call the Pope the head of the church. I mean, except for my rhetorical point, you know, but I can't help but wonder if that kind of rhetorical sloppiness that steps over the line and, you know, and again, I want to say that to say that it's heretical to call the Pope the head of the church is itself heretical. Mm-hmm. I mean, if that statement were to really stand on its own, it would be fairly impossible to contextualize or rehabilitate that. And so as a Catholic, again, I want to use this as a teachable moment, not only for me to learn a better way to speak, but also for us to learn a better way to understand this principle of participation in Christ and how there's a hierarchy. I'm reminded of what St. Thomas Aquinas does, not only in writing a commentary on the divine names by St. Saint Dionysius, but St. or Pseudo-Dionysius, you know, um, writes this uh, work called the celestial hierarchy and another one called the ecclesiastical hierarchy. And he's the one who actually coined the term hierarchy back in the in antiquity. And so a hierarchy is not like a, a pecking order. It's not a political power structure. It really has to do with the fact that from the seraphim and the cherubim all the way down to the archangels and the angels, the entire angelic choirs share in the fullness. And likewise, in the ecclesiastical hierarchy, he explains how, you know, the apostles and their successors possess this plenitude, but for the purpose not of hoarding it to themselves, but really of pouring it out, of lavishing it, of administering it. Yeah, and it's literally hieros is priest, right? The hierarchy is the rule of priests. So the, the whole creation is ordered so that the higher mediates and serves the lower. It's the way reality is structured according to St. Dionysus. That's right. And so the idea of sacred order or a priestly order, again, it doesn't exclude the lowest layperson because baptism confers upon us a participation in the royal priesthood of Christ. And so it's, it's different with the clergy. It's different in kind and not simply degree, but at the same time, we're distinguishing to unite, to show how the clergy and the laity are distinct but not separate. They're, they're, they're united in a way that goes beyond just, again, human votes. So, I mean, I could go on and on. I'm going to be teaching a course next semester on ecclesiology. And so perhaps next year, as we begin the new semester, we'll have some episodes that we, where we can return to discuss these matters, you know. But in the meantime, I wanted to recommend a few ecclesiological works, you know, my expertise is not ecclesiology, and I realize that there's a spectrum of ecclesiological opinion out there. You know, on the one extreme, you have Cardinal Avery Dallas's book, Models of the Church, and it's sort of, here's a model, pick a model, any model. And back in the 60s and 70s, I suppose, you know, that was au courant, but... Uh, sort of a grab bag. It, it really felt that way. Um, a rather eclectic sort of arrangement. And he, he, even he later walked, walked that back. Um, but, you know, I want to stand in the tradition that flows from St. Paul. Well, it begins with Christ himself through St. Paul, in particular St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, as does Charles Cardinal Journet. Now, he might be the single greatest theologian of the church in the 20th century. And, uh, he was made a cardinal. He has a series of volumes called The Church of the Word Incarnate, and only one volume was ever translated. And I think you and I both know uh, something exciting that is in the work. That was a shame, and so somebody should get on translating it. That's right. And so what we have done at the St. Paul Center through Emmaus Academic is to engage a team of translators so that the entire work of Charles Cardinal Journet who was a favorite of well, practically everybody. I and, mean, and a co-founder with Jacques Maritain of the journal No Bet Better. Better. That's right, which we also publish here at the St. Paul Center. Matthew Levering has sort of you know, brought that into a whole new level of engagement for scholars. But this book of his that Ignatius published distills that multi-volume series. We want to end up translating and publishing the entire series of volumes, but this 2004 
uh, publication, The Theology of the Church by Charles Cardinal Journet, I think is about as good as it gets. Now, he wasn't a Dominican, but he stands in the he, he, he definitely stands in the stream of the tradition of Aquinas. And Aquinas is a master because he distinguishes to unite, he distinguishes the, the juridical order of the institutional church that we would identify with the Pope as the vicar of Christ, as the successor to Peter, possessing primacy and infallibility and all of the rest. And at the same time, he would distinguish that from the church the totus Christus, the whole Christ, the mystical body of Christ, as Augustine and Aquinas understood it, which really sees that the church in her perfection, you might say the church in her essence, but that doesn't ex- exclude the visible church. It doesn't exclude the church that is suffering in union with Christ. And so I, I want to be careful when I speak of essence. I would say the church in her perfection, the church in her glory, the church as it represents the final destination for all of the pilgrims that we are, you know, that is not a separate church with a separate head. You know, as I was saying in the interview with Matt, as well as in the uh, the presentation that evening on campus in the gallery, uh, it, there really is a mysterious unity here that is not in any way threatened by distinguishing the three states of the church, heaven, earth, and under the earth. In fact, what you end up with is more than just a tight corporation. It really is a corpus Christi. It's it's more of an organism than it is an organization. And the Pope's role is absolutely indispensable. And, I, you know, if people are finding this a little bit too fast and furious, too over their heads, I should recommend in particular one chapter in my book, Reasons to Believe, How to Understand, Explain, and Defend the Catholic Faith, in particular, chapter 9, where I, 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 I think it's titled Peace of the Rock, only it's P-E-A-C-E, a typical pun, you know, from me. But that whole section of Reasons to Believe focuses on the nexus, the connection between the Old Testament and the New, but especially the, the, the Davidic kingdom covenant that Christ comes to fulfill as the son of David, which had 12 royal ministers likewise in the New, but one prime minister to whom, you know, the, the, the king gives the keys of the kingdom. So that succession and primacy and headship, as well as infallibility, are all rolled up into one and traced all the way back to Christ, who alone could vouchsafe that guarantee the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so uh, the other book that I want to recommend, I just thought of something. In my Catholic Bible Dictionary, there's a very brief article. If you feel like you're more of a beginner and you're just barely holding on, I have an article in that Catholic Bible Dictionary. I think it's entitled Papal Primacy. And I think that is also a very useful and simple place to start. But this is a more recent book, Introduction to the Mystery of the Church, that in fact is written by a Dominican. Journey was trained by the Dominicans, but this 2014 title that came out from Catholic University of America Press, Introduction to the Mystery of the Church, is by Benoit Dominique de la Sujel, OP. And uh, this, I'm, I was going to be using this as a textbook for my undergraduates, but I think it might be a little too steep of a climb for them. But this is a magnificent treatment as well. And so, you know, there are other books too. I'm thinking of Cardinal Schoenborn's book, Loving the Church, which was a retreat that he gave back when Pope St. John Paul II was still the pontiff. Are you writing your syllabus right now? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. (laughs) And that is going to be one of the textbooks that I do use. Oh, am I legible or transparent or what? Um, any, Any concluding thoughts that you have, Rob, as we wrap things up? Yeah, I I also had seen some of those things, and I, knowing your teaching um, and being familiar with it, I immediately saw what you were saying and sort of dismissed those. But I'm but I'm really glad that you did not do that and saw this as an opportunity to not say, hey, that that's what I mean, and do a he said she said thing. And the the most tiresome thing on the internet, I think, is the the explaining away the explanation of how you got wrong what I said. And uh, 
And so I think this is this has been really worth doing. I would throw in another uh, to the the book list. Oh, another Dominican a classic short book. So I like to recommend short books. To Vincent who McNabb, don't read huge books. Infallibility. Is this still in print? I don't think so. I'm going to borrow your copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, that is a mighty fine Dominican and a mighty fine short readable book. Yeah. yeah but I want to just, just take it back for a second because, you know, when I, became, when I became aware of the criticisms and the kerfluffle and all of this kind of stuff, I'd like to be able to say that just like a, a holy angel, I rose above it. I didn't react. I didn't feel defensive. I didn't go through the stages of grief and anger. But that would be a total lie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. I, I, I went back and I listened to myself. Oh man, you know, I always, um, I, 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 I despise listening. I, I always can think of a better way to say every single sentence. But more to the point, you know, you go through the sense of like, oh come on, you could have understood what I meant. Listen to it in context. But, you know, why would I need to burden the, the viewer, the listener, you know, with the context as I intended it, when in fact, in that context, I said something which is just plainly off. And it came to my attention because smart people, people who know better, you know, were getting hold of me saying, did Scott say this? And, you know, what do we do with that? And I'm like, I don't know, uh, you know. When I was your age, television was called books, but I'll go look at it, and uh, and so I'm. I, I again, I think this is this is a salutary exercise, both for the people who might have been confused, as an opportunity to talk more about the papacy, and as um, as Mother and or not Mother Angelical, but uh, Mother Teresa once explained to Father Groeschel, humiliations can be an excellent route to humility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, this is not 426. This is 2023. I'm not 72 like Augustine was. I'm only 66. But this will probably not be the last of my retractations. I am sure as I go back over my works, my talks, and, you know, all of my recorded ruminations, I am going to have regrets and perhaps I'll have opportunities to, uh, to clarify these kinds of things and perhaps even to correct things that were misstated. Um, and so let this be today, my, you know, my feeble attempt to help clean up the mess because, you know, uh, the biggest mess I can affect the change in is the, is the mess that I make in my own life, in my own heart, and in also my, uh, my reckless verbiage. And so thanks be to God and to Our Lady as well. And I just send this out along with you uh, to everyone in the hopes that uh, we can really bring greater clarity, and uh, clean up the mess. Indeed. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, your eternal Son, our Savior, our King, the Lord of Lords, and the head of the church. We also thank you for the papacy, going all the way back to St. Peter, with all of his strengths and weaknesses. And we thank you for that unbroken succession of popes that have given to us a visible head for the earthly church and that how you have used him to bind and loose, to proclaim the gospel. And even when popes in the past have made a mess, you've always sent the Holy Spirit to help clean them up. Help us, O oh Lord, to take responsibility for the messes that we make as well. And help us to do the, to do the best job possible in purifying our hearts and in cleaning up our own lives, that someday we will stand before you and behold your fatherly face and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We ask all of these things in the strong, powerful, and holy name of Jesus and through his most sacred heart in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us on this episode of Road to Emmaus. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you.